El Cognac, llamado así por la ciudad de Cognac en Francia, es una variedad de brandy, vino destilado, que solo se produce en la región vinícola que rodea esta ciudad. Se debe hacer con uvas específicas, destilar dos veces en alambiques de cobre y envejecer al menos por dos años en barricas de roble francés. Con el nombre de Cognac conocemos a esta pequeña ciudad y a una de las bebidas más famosas de todo el mundo, símbolo de lujo y distinción. Gran parte de esta ciudad se encuentra sobre la margen izquierda del río Cherun, la puerta de Saint Jacques. Esas dos torres que observamos al fondo eran su entrada y paso obligado de muchos de los peregrinos que se dirigían a Santiago de Compostela durante la Edad Media. El Castillo Real de Cognac fue el lugar que vio nacer al rey Francisco I de Francia, quien más tarde fuera rey de este país. En el siglo XVII, el rey Carlos X se hizo cargo del castillo y lo reconstruyó por completo. Más adelante y casi a punto de ser destruido, fue adquirido por el barón John Baptiste Otag, quien lo compró en 1795, dando paso al nacimiento de uno de los Cognacs con más renombre en el mundo. La parte más antigua del castillo fue construida en el siglo X durante la Guerra de los 100 Años. Como podrán ver, el programa de hoy viene cargado de mucha historia. Elizabeth es quien nos guiará a través de un recorrido por la arquitectura, las bodegas húmedas, oscuras y los aromas que encierra este castillo medieval. El Coñac Barón Otard. La historia de uno de los coñac más famosos en el mundo. So my name is Elizabeth and I've been working here as a guide for a year in the Chateau Royal de Cognac, uh, in the town of Cognac, obviously, in the southwest of France. And uh, this place has a history that spans over 1,000 years. It actually all started with a small wooden fortress, no stone, a small wooden fortress built right here in the middle of the 10th century in order to watch and push back any potential attacks from the Normans, the Vikings, who still had a base camp a bit further down the river. And then once the fortress was destroyed, the chateau in its stone version was built in many, many stages, as you might imagine. It had hours of glory with a number of kings from France and England, who were the earls of the place. And it had darker times as well when it was partially destroyed for example, during the French Revolution. And nowadays, it's become the home, uh, the working place of uh, Cognac Baron Otard, and it's been so for more than two centuries. So this room takes us back to the very beginnings of the stone version of this chateau, because it goes back for its structure to the 12th century. It's called La Salle au Casque, because there's a casque, a helmet, above the fireplace in the middle of uh, this molding. And you can see that it's surrounded by two animals, who lost their heads, sadly, during the revolution. It was a swan on the left and a young bear on the right-hand side. And you can see they're holding a shield between their paws. And this shield and this coat of arms is the coat of arms of the Valois family, the family of Francis I. And you see in this part of France, the history, French history often mingles with the history of England. This is the heritage of Aliénor d'Aquitaine, of course. If you look towards the top of this room, you can see some signs of the existence of a first floor. Uh, there are some openings here and there, what's left of another fireplace here. And yes, there was a first floor here that was built in the 13th century and which was destroyed during the French Revolution. It was built by the Lusignan family, the earls of Angoulême at the time. La Sala del Escudo es el lugar más admirado y antiguo del Castillo Real de Cognac. Se asegura que fue diseñada por Leonardo da Vinci, aunque no existe una documentación histórica que confirme tal hecho. And here you get to meet uh, the family in a way. Francis I here on my right looking rather confident and he did have a very strong character and this was probably due to, partly at least, to his size because this man was a giant for his time, almost two meters. So you can imagine how impressive it must have been to meet somebody that tall in the early 16th century. Now I don't know if he inherited his size from his mother, but there she is on my left. Her name was Louise de Savoie. 
and she was married to his father at the age of 12 years. It was an arranged marriage, of course, and for the anecdote, it was one of her husband's mistresses who was in charge of educating her until she became an adult. And as an adult, she was a very strong lady, very, very determined and very um, educated. She brought a whole court of artists and musicians here in the Chateau de Cognac. It was a very, very pleasant court here. And here in the centre is the king's first wife. Her name was Claude de France. And uh, she gave the king seven children between the ages of 15 and 25 years. Uh, and afterwards, sadly, she died. She died of exhaustion at the age of 25. So welcome here in the States room, La Salle des Etats. And I think that here we can say goodbye Middle Ages and hello Renaissance with these uh, wide light spaces and huge windows as well. And it was Francis I himself who asked for this entire wing to be built facing the river Charente. The building started when he'd been king for a couple of years in 1517 and it finished eight years later in 1525. It's not a surprise to hear that this stage room was mainly used as a reception room. Imagine a little bit the parties that went on here 500 years ago and nowadays still uh, it is used sometimes for parties, receptions, we can have weddings for example, we've had concerts as well. The acoustics here is absolutely fantastic and it's lovely isn't it to think that these places are still in use, that the Pearl of Cognac, that's the nickname of this room, uh, still echoes sometimes with the sound of the music and the laughter, as used to be the case uh, more than 500 years ago. But I think I can think of one person, one person for whom receptions were not at the top of their list of priorities, and that was the Baron. Because imagine him coming in here for the very first time. He certainly had a smile on his face, but I think that in his mind he started aligning not the guests, but the barrels in these fantastic volumes that the room was offering. And that's what he did, actually. There was a double fireplace over there between the two rooms. These were two separate rooms, as you can easily imagine. There was no communication in between. And he was the one who had it removed, simply so that you could roll the barrels easily from one room to the other. And there you go, you ended up having some cognac aging cellars in these two grand rooms for more than a century and a half. It lasted until the 1950s. And then, when the cellars were moved elsewhere, the walls had to get a good clean because they were covered at that time in that black layer. It's a fungus. Uh, this is quite typical of the cellars of Cognac. And now we're going to move on to the next room called La Salle des Gardes, the guards room. Las paredes de piedra caliza talladas de esta sala que nos enseña Elizabeth fueron utilizadas por los prisioneros ingleses e irlandeses que estuvieron allí durante la Guerra de los Siete Años, una serie de conflictos internacionales acontecidos entre principios de 1756 y finales de 1763. Estos hombres tallaron sus nombres, objetos y botes en estas paredes, y hoy tienen significado histórico. A través de ellos, también nos acercamos un poco a la historia del lugar. In this last part, we focus a little bit more on the history of the brand Baron Otar, the history of the family Otar as well, who were not French to begin with. Uh, the very first origins go back to Norway. They were Vikings, in a way. And in the 10th century, a branch of the family settled in Scotland. And they came to France at the end of the 17th century. And in this room, you have all sorts of documents of archives, uh, old shipping documents, and 20 barrels sent to New Zealand in 1875, for example. Uh, old advertisements as well. Sometimes you see the word brandy because this was prior to the label, the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. On this table is a selection of uh, Cognac Baron Otard. They're not all there, but there's a, that's a lovely selection. And the first three will correspond to some categories of age which are called qualité, qualities in the jargon. And these qualities are common to all houses. For everybody it means the same, even if the taste is different because it's a different blend. But for instance, VS, very special. This is a blend of eau de vie with a minimum age of two and a half years, and it will go up to five years. The next one up, the VSOP, very superior old pale. Minimum age here, four and a half years, and it will go up to 12 years. Then comes the, extra, the XO, sorry, that's the extra old. Plenty of time here to develop some more complex, some richer aromas, because it will stretch from 10 years to 40 years. 
And beyond that, each house have their own out of age cognacs, cognac hors d'âge, as we call them in French. Uh, for example, we have the extra, which begins at 20 years, it will go up to 60 years, and this one contains very special eau de vie from the Paradise Cellar. So, if we want to sum up cognac in one simple sentence, I think the basic step that we need to remember is that cognac is a blend that we call assemblage in French of eau de vies that were distilled twice. This is a major uh, factor uh, that were aging for a minimum of two and a half years in oak casks and that come from a very specific territory. And all these points are to do with the label, the appellation d'origine contrôlée of cognac and there are many many other rules as well it's extremely strict and that's what guarantees a top quality product as well of course the ones with the best reputation are the eau de vies coming from the champagne areas because they're fine because they are delicate because these are the ones with the capacity to age beautifully over 60 80 years those ones on the other hand wouldn't age for more than 40 years after which the quality would start declining and all the other V's which are used to make cognac come from white wine. And in the vast majority of the territory, uh, it is the same type of grapes, the same cépage which is used. It's called uni blanc. It was brought to us by the Romans in the first century. And uni blanc produces a wine which is not very strong. It's only between 8 and 10 degrees. And it's quite acidic as well. It's not nice to drink as a table wine. But the acidity is a good thing. It's an asset for distillation and for the quality of eau de vie. That's why we use it. Okay, so in the process of making cognac, you need to use a copper still. A still is called an alambic in French. And this one is very old. So nowadays, the alambics are larger. You would see several of them in a row in a distillery, but the principle itself is unchanged. You have the wine and you're going to boil it. Most houses are going to preheat it first in this central part, which is called a réchauffant, and then the warm wine will be transferred into the boiler where it can start boiling properly. So evaporation takes place, and the alcohol vapors, starting with the strongest, the most volatile alcohols, are going to swirl up, rise up, and they're going to travel slowly along the swan's neck, through the still, and they're going to finish their circuit in here, in a serpentine, which is immersed in cold water. This cools the vapors down, there's going to be condensation and you end up therefore with a liquid which is called brouillis and which has reached a degree of alcohol of 28, 30 degrees roughly. But it's not finished because one of the major principles of cognac is double distillation, so you need to start again. Uh, you're going to use the brouillis this time and carry out a second distillation which we usually call la bonne chauffe, the right distillation. Here, in this cellar, we're surrounded by huge barrels, which we call foudre uh, in French. And there, there's no evaporation taking place because the volume is too big. So these barrels are not used for aging, but they're used for storage. In here, you usually have some eau de vies which have finished aging in the small barrels. They're ready, they're mature, they're at their best, and they're waiting to be used in a recipe, in a mix, in a blend X, Y, Z, a bit like a kitchen ingredient in a rather massive kitchen cupboard. Here we're in what we call the dry cellar because there's nothing here to attract humidity so the atmosphere is drier and that's why we're going to lose more water through the process of evaporation and that's how eventually these eau de vies will become uh, stronger and spicier uh, than the ones coming from the humid cellar. You can see lots of young barrels around you. These are brand new actually and it is necessary to have some young barrels because this is where the eau de vie is going to begin aging just for a few months and during those first few months it's going to get some sort of a, an intensive course in aromas and in tannins and then it will get transferred to an older barrel in which the aromas will no longer come from the wood but they will come from the air the work of the air all these chemical reactions of exit reduction that will take place for tens and tens of years if necessary 
Here we are in a part of the chateau, which is called Les Voûtes Basses du Chateau, the lower vaults. We're underneath the Salle des Etats and the Salle des Gardes. And here in the lower vaults, every year you're going to have, all year long, you're going to have 15 degrees temperature. And all year long, you're going to have this very strong humidity, which is quite noticeable. It's around 90%. And there are two reasons for these conditions. The first is the river which is very close, of course, and the second one is the walls and their thickness. Look at this, two meters, three meters in parts, and this is super insulation. This is what guarantees the consistency of these conditions, which are absolute gold for the eau de vies, because these are the very conditions of what we call un chai humide, a humid cellar. There are dry cellars, of course, but it's in here, in the humid cellar, that the eau de vie can acquire all its roundness, all its sweetness. The walls in this cellar are covered in a black color, a black layer. This is actually a fungus, which is called Torella coniacensis, and that spreads on the walls. And the reason why it spreads on the walls here, in particular, is that it loves alcohol vapors. It feeds on alcohol vapors, and it's in for quite a treat here. Let me give you just one figure. For Baron Tart, for this brand only, every year we lose the equivalent of 300,000 bottles of alcohol that escape from the barrels through the pores of the wood, that's the principle of aging. They feed the fungus on the way and they end up in the sky up there and that's why, fortunately, it's not lost for everyone, that's why it becomes the angel's property. That's why we call it the angel's share, la part des anges. And believe me, I think the angels above Cognac are having a, a pretty good time. Pero te preguntarás por el significado de la frase eau de vis? Literalmente y traducido del francés sería Agua de vida. Se refiere exclusivamente al brandy producido a partir de la fermentación y doble destilación de las uvas blancas con las que se elabora el coñac. Y en países de habla inglesa, este término es utilizado para las bebidas destiladas hechas a base de frutas que no sean uvas. The eau de vis in this cellar are not all the same, of course, and that's why there are codes on the barrels to explain what they are. For example, this one. This barrel contains an eau de vie coming from Petite Champagne. This is one of the different territories of Cognac. There are six territories, precisely. It was distilled in 1990, so it's becoming uh, quite nice. It's almost 30 years of age. 45 barrels in this same line contain the same eau de vie. And finally, 280 liters. That is the volume, that is the size of the barrels that we have here. There are bigger barrels in other cellars, it doesn't really matter, there's no specific rule about it. Here's a different one, you see? If you look at it carefully, you realize it doesn't have any year of distillation. The reason being that this has already been blended. But once the blend has been made, it still needs to go back in the barrel for a year or two or so, so that everybody in there gets on well. And in there, actually, you have approximately 200 very, very old ladies, as we call them. They're the old eau de vies, very old eau de vies. And the oldest one in here was distilled in 1820. And it comes from that special place that we call the Paradise Cellar. This is the Forti San Fidelis. This is our best cognac. It was created by our cellar master, Michel Casavecchia, 10 years ago, roughly. Very, very special one indeed. El respeto por la tradición lo podemos comprobar cuando Elizabeth nos invita a conocer la bodega Paraíso. Allí reposan brandis destilados entre 1820 y 1943. This very special place is called the Paradise Cellar. We're actually in what used to be one of the prison cells of the chateau, the very humid, very stuffy atmosphere. But nowadays it's turned to the other extreme because in here, in this Paradise Cellar, we keep the memory of the house, the treasure of the house. These around me are the oldest eau de vies of the house. They were distilled between 1820, when Napoleon was still alive, and 1943. But as you can see, they're not kept in barrels. They're kept in demijohns. A demijohn is a glass bottle with this shape, and the demijohns are protected inside those baskets. And they've been spending all this time in the demijohns ever since the cellar master, 150 years ago, for example, decided to put them in there because they were quite exceptional, because they had qualities that you don't find every year. And since they've been in glass, they haven't been aging because glass doesn't let the air through. So no, no air, no aging. This means that these eau de vies have remained just as beautiful for all this time. And from time to time, 
somebody uses them in touches, uh, that somebody is the cellar master, who will open the demijohns and use those eau de vies in touches in the creation of the blends of the best cognacs uh, of the house. And that's how a paradise cellar works. And the beautiful thing in all this really is this idea of transmission beyond the generations, because you can be certain that the cellar master back in 1850, for example, knew perfectly well uh, that a long time after his own death, another one would come back and use his favorite uh, demijohn, and that's quite beautiful. Around here, actually, we say that we drink our father's and grandfather's cognac, and then we make cognac for our children and our grandchildren, and I think it sums it up uh, quite beautifully indeed. Algunas botellas y los precios se pueden observar en la tienda del castillo. Allí encuentras toda una selección de coñacs Barón o Tart. Existe una botella llamada Fortis et Fidelis, diseñada por Christophe Pilet en la cristalería San Lois. Una botella que puede ser comprada por unos 3.725 euros actualmente, un poco más de 4.000 dólares o más de 15 millones de pesos colombianos. Una verdadera joya. And here, finally, we have a tasting to conclude the visit of the chateau. So, for example, here we have the prestige visit, which consists, to begin with, the, the VSOP, minimum four and a half years, and then followed with an EXO, minimum ten years. Okay, you usually start with tasting the youngest one first, because although they're both 40 degrees, the younger a cognac is, the drier it's going to be, the sharper it's going to be. So, I think we can... Uh, uh, Divide a tasting into three parts, the eye, the nose, and the mouth, okay? For the eye first, you want to put your glass against a neutral background, for example, the window, okay? And you're going to look at your cognac either from the side of the glass or from above, okay? A VS will be fairly light with some silver reflection, whereas a VSOP will develop some more golden reflections. And of course, you will get some warmer coppery reflections in the next zone, for example. The second, uh, the second part, sorry, is going to be the nose, of course. So some people think you should put your nose right in the middle. It's not necessarily a good idea because you would get mainly the alcohol. So just bring the glass to your nose. You may want to use your fingers like that and have a little smell of it, all right? And then you want to swirl your cognac. And if you look at it from the side, you will see that the cognac is crying, it's weeping. You can see some tears on the side of the glass, and that's actually the fat hanging on. And it's those tears that inspire the design of bottles such as this one, for example. And once you've swirled your glass, you're going to bring it to your nose again, and you will realize how the aromas come out more strongly. And finally, thirdly, at last, the mouth. So the first sip is going to be a very small sip. You're just going to put some cognac on your tongue and a palate to prepare your mouth to what's coming. The second sip is going to be more important and you're going to sort of chew your cognac and it's going to help get the aromas in a stronger fashion. And for the rest, it's entirely your choice, of course. Al probarlos, los gustos pueden diferir entre uno y otro. Hay quienes prefieren los cognacs más jóvenes y afrutados o existen personas que se inclinarán por los sabores o notas más antiguas y amaderadas. Actualmente los viñedos de coñac cubren cerca de unas 75.000 hectáreas de terreno. Hoy salen al mercado cerca de 190 millones de botellas aproximadamente, que se exportan en un 98% a 160 países, desde Estados Unidos hasta el lejano oriente. Y Noruega es uno de los mejores compradores. Allí se consume la mayor cantidad de coñac del mundo por persona, en relación con el tamaño de la población. Los recorridos a través de estos muros históricos nos transportan a una época memorable. Todavía seguimos disfrutando de las mismas cosas buenas. Una rica mezcla entre historia y tradición. <risa>